Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee to order. It is uh, Tuesday, April 9th, 2024, and we do have a quorum present. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda today, and first on our agenda is um, Senator Murphy's Senate File 1745. Um, and Senator Murphy, you have a, an A2 amendment. Would you like to adopt that as an author's amendment? Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members. Uh, thank you for having me this morning. And yes, uh, I would love to put the bill in its proper order with the adoption of that amendment. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Mann moves the A2 amendment. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The A2 amendment is adopted. And Madam Chair, if you would um, allow me, uh, I would love it if you would consider an oral amendment to the A2 amendment. And that would be on page four, line 4.27, in changing the word coalition to collaborative. Thank you, uh, Senator Murphy. Um, could Senate Council please state the amendment for us? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the amendment would be page four, line 27, delete coalition and insert collaborative. Members, um, any questions about the, um, the oral amendment? Senator Mann moves the oral amendment. Um, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The oral amendment is adopted. Senator Murphy. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I am happy to be before you today with S Senate File 1745 as amended. Uh, I did not anticipate uh, that I would be before this committee with this legislation. Uh, this is the work product of uh, my long summer listening to Minnesotans uh, as they shared with me their recent experiences with our health care system and Senator Kerry Dietzik's experience uh, with the health care system herself. Um, and both of those experiences drove us uh, separately and then together to the question of where is the money going in our health care system and are we serving the people well? Uh, I spoke briefly yesterday with Senator Abler and he asked me to remind the committee that uh, this proposal is on a dual track. So the reason why there's a delete all before you attaching this legislation to a bill that was already in this committee is because we're also going to hear it in state gov uh, today. Um, and so I, I just want to be really clear that there isn't uh, uh, anything but a process here. Uh, this bill will move from here uh, to the Judiciary Committee. It will have to go to the Rules Committee because it is late. Um, and it'll go to state gov where it belongs and it will be laid over there for further work. So this is not a fast track like we're going to move it through, uh, but it is late. Uh, in part because neither Leader Dietzik nor I appreciated that we would be in the positions that we're in now. Um, but we believe, both of us together, that it is an, a necessary piece of legislation, one of discovery rooted in the values that I believe that we share. One, that we want a health care system uh, that's serving the people of Minnesota across the state. Um, and two, that we are wise and effective stewards of the people's money. And we know, and you know particularly as members of the Health and Human Services Finance Committee, that there are lots and lots of public dollars going into a health care system. But as we listen to Minnesotans, those dollars are not necessarily serving our, our districts well, the geographic places of our state well, um, the people of Minnesota well. And we also know that they're putting a lot of their own money into the health care, their health care. And they're asking us the question, and I heard loud and clear from them this summer, uh, why does it cost so much and I'm not getting what I need in terms of care? Um, so that's why we're here today. Senate file 1745 creates the Minnesota Commission for Equitable Healthcare Services. It is a commission of Minnesotans to look at this problem uh, that we're experiencing together. And it also creates the means by which the state auditor can receive information from ac accountable healthcare entities demonstrating the use of state appropriations for their intended use. This is the work of Senator Dietzik, which I believe is very important. Uh, the Minnesota Commission for Equitable Healthcare Services will travel the state and meet people in their communities to gather their stories about how our healthcare system impacts their families, neighbors, businesses, and careers. 
The information collected directly from the public will guide the Commission's goal of discovering why so many Minnesotans can't afford to get sick or hurt, no matter what type of coverage they have. And recently we saw a news report that Minnesotans are experiencing high levels of coverage. But despite that coverage, they're still paying a lot of money out of pocket and that out of money, out of pocket money is serving as a deterrent to actually getting care. We also know that because of consolidation of systems, that there are lots of places in the state of Minnesota now that are absent necessary in basic care. Experts from across the healthcare industry will advise the commission on the technical and analytical aspects of our healthcare system and help connect the stories gathered from every corner of Minnesota to specific policy or financial decisions made within the healthcare industry. This process of discovery and forming connections will steer the commission toward developing policies that will get Minnesotans meaningful access to health care. 30 years ago, Minnesotans were wrestling with the question of access to care and the cost of care. And as a result of that wrestle, they created a health care commission. And that two-year process of a people's commission led to the reforms that developed Minnesota Care. This summer and fall, I spent some time with Jim Koppel, who recently retired from the Department of Human Services. He was the first executive director of that health care commission. And he said, you have to just keep pushing on the door until it opens up, until the pathway for the reform that we seek and need becomes available. And he encouraged us, the legislature, to look again at the path that was created 30 years ago when Minnesotans came together to say, this isn't working for us. And they helped us find a better way. There was a Star Tribune editorial last weekend, not this weekend, but the weekend before, about the prior authorization legislation moving through this, this legislature. Prior authorization is an instrument used by the financial part of health insurance uh, on a regular basis. And the legislation that's moving this session is not the first time we've tried to reform prior authorization because it becomes a tool to deny necessary care. You know, I ran for office the first time after I took care of my mom at the end of her life because the care that she needed was denied by the insurance industry. And it frustrated my family. And it's still happening. And the Star Tribune lauded the effort of the legislature to one more time take a look at prior authorization to make sure it was working for people. And I wonder why it is the case that we pour so much public money into a system, and then that system uses that money to deny care. Do we understand that relationship in a way? And do we have our hands on it in a way that we are delivering on the commitment that we have made to Minnesotans to create a health care system that serves them? I think that is the question I want to put to a commission of Minnesotans who have expert advisors from the industry for, so they can come back and bring recommendations to the legislature. We are wrestling all the time with facets of the industry that show up as problems for the people we represent. It shows up for the healthcare system itself. And if we look at this proposal as a system of discovery, as a means of discovery, as a means of transparency, and we work together, including those who are subject to the discovery, the inquiry, those who are working in the system, our trusted providers, I do believe that those Minnesotans can bring to us a recommendation or recommendations that will help guide our public policy making. And that is the whole purpose of this legislation. According to CMS, in 2022, Americans spent $4.5 trillion on health care. That's $13,493 per person. That's 17.3% of our GDP, and it's higher than any other nation in the world. And yet we know Minnesotans are not getting the care that they need. And some of the stories that I heard um, over the summer and fall are the stories I'm sure you're hearing as well. A man in Faribault calling the healthcare system a barking dog on a chain. I was at that with uh, Dr. Mann. He was very eloquent in his description of a system that's no longer serving him. I heard stories from people in Albert Lee uh, who can't get a primary care visit in the Mayo system anymore. So they're going to Iowa to get their initial primary care. One woman who testified that by the time she got the primary care she needed, she had a cancer that had advanced far enough so that when she finally did see the specialist, the specialist said, what took you so long? Your cancer's well advanced. That happened in Mankato as well. I sat in a living and dining room 
uh, filled with families in the district I represent, of families who can't get access to mental health care for their children. They're all in St. Paul. Um, they're in a what feels like a desert. They can't get meaningful care. We have heard story after story um, this session about systems closing or services closing, Foston closing, New Prague closing, um, Mercy and Unity Hospital closing down units, Children's in Alina closing units uh, of beds of care that people need. And it is happening around us despite our very best efforts. Legislative appropriations to Minnesota's healthcare entities are made without competitive bidding or auditing and with minimal reporting. We know how much the state pays healthcare entities to provide care, but we don't have much of a way of knowing how much money is going to the people who, who need care or how much of it is eaten up by company overhead. This bill is not meant to vilify healthcare entities in Minnesota. I know personally that there are good people working for them and they help people access medical care, but that doesn't mean we should continue to aid a system that is failing Minnesotans. This bill is about transparency. It's about collecting the needed information so that the Healthcare Commission can provide the legislature with quality recommendations that actually address the rising costs with the healthcare system. The commission's work is discovery. We can't fix a system we don't understand. The commission will follow the complex web of corporate corporations, administrative hurdles, network constraints, and cultural biases in a system that forced too many Minnesotans into delaying or avoiding care altogether. And with that, I'm happy for your questions, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Um, would you like to have your testifiers testify, and then we can open it up for discussion? That would be great. Um, first, we have, by way of Zoom, we have Jeannie Jackson. If you can please um, state your name and begin your testimony. I see her name on the Zoom screen, but I'm not hearing anything. Oh, there we go. Uh, welcome to the committee. Oh. Thank you. My name is Jeannie Jackson, and I'm one of the leaders of the Rural Organizing Project of Isaiah, Minnesota. I'm also a licensed social worker whose code of ethics state that I should try to write injustices. And this is why I'm grateful for this opportunity to address this committee. In 1997, Mayo Clinic merged with Albert Lee, Minnesota. They told us they were going to expand and make our health care system even better than it was. By 2017, within a 10 year period, Mayo Clinic slowly dismantled our full service hospital to where we are currently in a state now where we are a transition station. In April of 2023, I found a lump in my right breast. It was one year ago. I made a call to the Mayo Clinic in Albert Lee and requested a mammogram. This was on a Tuesday afternoon. I was told I'd get a call back. Six days later, the following Monday, I called again and told them that I had not heard back within that week. And they told me that I would for sure hear back that week and they took my name and information again. The following Monday, I took my 83-year-old mother to her doctor appointment. When she was finished, I looked at the nurse and said, I know that this is her appointment, but I've had a hard time getting in to get a mammogram. I found a lump, and I believe my lump is changing. She pulled up my information and told me that I should hear something by Wednesday. I didn't hear anything. Thursday morning, I called Mercy One of, Al or of Iowa. By Friday morning, I had a mammogram scheduled, and they did a biopsy on Monday, and I was told that I had breast cancer, and I had a very aggressive breast cancer. The following week was lots of tests, and a week later, chemo. My tumor grew from a 2.8 to an 8.6 in two weeks. I was told that the delay certainly did hurt me. In the medical profession, their code of ethics is to do no harm. This baffles me regarding the Mayo Clinic position. First, they bought the Albert Lee Hospital. 
and dismantled it. And everyone knows how difficult it is for people in rural communities to get medical help. And yet, knowing that, they still dismantled our hospital. Regardless of how many cures or drugs you come up with to fight cancer, everyone will tell you that the key is early detection. And if Mayo Clinic is not able to see patients in a timely manner, even for basic routine checkups, how important is time to them? Since this journey began, I've had chemo, I've, and I had to stop it. I've had a mastectomy, undergone radiation, and they attempted chemo again, which they had to stop. I'm on God's plan now, and having the privilege to use my valuable time to talk with you continues to align with my mission of writing injustices. People who live in communities like Albert Lee need a commission like what Senator Murphy is proposing so that rural communities have a voice and protect critical health care services. This commission has the ability to help save lives, literally. I pray my two-minute assist each of you and will help you remember that how important and valuable this work is. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today and sharing your story with us. Um, next, I have Mary Crinky. Welcome, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, my name is Mary Crinky, and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. Hospitals and health systems would certainly be one of the many organizations that would be considered an accountable health care entity under the newly amended 1745. And, and there would certainly be some administrative cost to hospitals uh, for keeping expense records and receipts because of the granular nature of the documentation called for in this legislation. Having said that, um, what I'd really like to talk about today is some of the data that is already available that I don't know that all the legislators here really know what all is being done. Um, Minnesota's nonprofit hospitals already do much of this work, and we provide an enormous amount of data and information to the Minnesota Department of Health. I just want to talk about two of the data sources that are available and the information that is currently collected. Um, with, there's something known as the Healthcare Cost Information System. We call it HICSIS, and it is a state mandated public reporting system that is administered by MHA and goes to MDH. And under this information, the annual data reporting includes revenues, expenses, staffing, service volumes, and services offerings. An example of the expenses that are detailed include salaries and wages, benefits, purchase services, supplies, interest, depreciation, and the staffing data shows breakouts of physicians, RNs, LPNs, aides, and other allied health professionals. It has inpatient um, volume information and several outpatient service information. There's also a second data source called the Encounter Claims Database. And this is database that shows diagnostic and procedure codes with an ability to show this information based on gender, race, ethnicity, and language. And we began collecting REL data, race, ethnicity, and language data about 10 years ago. And I think that there is a lot of this information that the Department of Health, I'm sure they would need some money for some studies, <laughs> but I am sure that they could put together an enormous amount of information if you wanted to look at certain service lines and, and get information based on REL. I think we have untapped resources um, that might be of benefit to look at before necessarily having to create a commission. Also, we are a little concerned about the new role for the state auditor and wonder kind of should this information be done by the Minnesota Department of Health. I just want to close by reminding everyone that hospitals are a little bit unique compared to many of the other providers. We're open 24 hours a day. We serve anyone in the emergency room regardless of their ability to pay. Our statewide average now is 64% of our patients are a government payer, either Medicare or Medicaid. And I just want to say hospitals are striving to eliminate bias in healthcare delivery. So thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, members, do you have questions or um, comments about the bill? Uh, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say thank you to Senator Murphy for bringing this bill. Um, I, too, have had many conversations uh, with Minnesotans in different parts of the state and certainly in my own community, uh, both in my role as a legislator and in my role as a nurse. And it is very, very clear that our current health care system is failing Minnesotans every day in many different ways. And so trying to get our arms around that and to get data and information to guide our actions is exactly what we should be doing as we have a responsibility in the legislature to be sure that we have a system that is caring for people. Um, and you know that I've hoped that that's what all of us want is a system that really is centered around care for people and, and gets them the care that they need. And we know right now that just isn't the case. So thank you for bringing this so we can move in that direction. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. Um, just trying to get my arms around this thing. And Senator Murphy, thanks for the conversation. Um, well, you and I have been in this business for quite a while. Um, and <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out what's the outcome of this going to be if it actually gets going. And I don't know if it's really going to pass this year or not, but I fully appreciate um, the concerns that the testifier had, and you don't have to go very far to find somebody who's dissatisfied with how it's working. Um, you don't have to go very far to look at the international rankings and discover as a country we have failed to provide good health care with the amount of money we spend. Um, and things have changed a lot uh, over time. Uh, in 2011 and 12 and 13, there was this uh, episode Huntley then with like, oh, we have to do something. And so we spent literally trillion, trillions of dollars on the Affordable Care Act. Um, prior to that, we had about 5% people in Minnesota who were uninsured. Um, and a lot of them had pretty good policies that had reasonable premiums and modest deductibles and affordable co-pays. And now many people who are covered uh, have very high premiums, like $20,000 or $30,000 and $10,000 co-pays and their $40,000 from their first dollar of coverage. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we've chatted on this committee about that. Have to do something. Um, so I think we just need to be careful what the something is. And I just want to remind, you already know this, but there's a lot of things we do know. Um, there's a lot of, can you call it middlemen? Is that what we still call them? Like middle, middle companies uh, who are interfacing between the provider and the person who actually pays the money, if it's a business or if it's the um, individual. Um, and so just, let me, and so um, the co corporate consolidations, which is what happened at Albert Lee, which is happening in Coon Rapids when for good fiscal responsibility, Alina decides to close this pediatric thing, which I think is a horrible idea. People haven't heard me say that four times. Um, and, um, but the problem isn't the providers. I don't think um, the problem is me. Uh, just, you know, in average reimbursement rate in state programs, I get less than $30 a visit. And our expenses are more than that. And we take everybody. Um, you come in, if you can't pay, it's like, well, thanks for coming, and let us help you somehow. And so I think you want to be careful as you proceed with this to, to put the pressure where the pressure belongs. And I don't know that the, that the garden variety clinicians are the ones that you even need to know much about. Um, and I don't know even uh, if the hospitals need to know much about them, um, because as the payer mix increases, past 64 percent of the governor's budget, there's ways to add more people to public programs, um, which well, that'll come up later today, ironically. Um, and so I want to caution you as we do this, another version of the let's look into healthcare further dance, is the big companies are going to get bigger and the providers are going to get squished. Um, and uh, maybe we do need to change something top to bottom. But the people who have the most money and the most flex and the most influence are the big ones. And Blue Cross has gone from being a pretty good provider to being a nonprofit in charge of a lot of for-profit companies. 
Uh, the insurance companies hire a for-profit company to shave the bills off of uh, out-of-network costs. That was in yesterday's paper. Um, and they just extract money. And so how do you find a way to make people who have no business getting the money extract the money? And I'm not sure if your commission will get at this, but that's who you want to target. Um, and why are there no more independent providers? How do they suck up every hospital and every independent doc? There's like, you know, a handful across the state. And they're truly free to do what they think is best, if they can get into the network. And so um, I, I think we already know a lot of the problems. And we try to do a dance and do whack-a-mole. And we're trying to do prior authorizations. And yet the big powers are like, oh, we can't do that. Um, and who said Blue Cross gets to determine our policy? Who says Medica and the rest of them get to decide what we do? Um, who says Alina gets to decide if my people live or die in Coon Rapids? That's the questions we got to ask. And so I think, as I will help you if you can, but I don't think granularly talking to little providers like me who are barely making payroll um, and asking me to do more reporting is going to be effective. But let's, you and I and others, target where the money is and find a way to rest the inappropriately having money from those folks who just sit there and, and, and make their shareholders rich and enrich the, uh, the principles. So I'm, I'm with you in the concept, but let's make sure we don't make something worse as you try to discover that. All right, thank you very much. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Abler. Um, I always th think about the work that we have done together and. I appreciated yesterday your um, uh, the comments about the Affordable Care Act, um, but I also think about the decision that got made before the ACA was implemented about high deductible plans. Um, I remember that clearly, the, the debate about that and worrying about that and not supporting that, and yet it became law um, over time. And we see now what that means uh, for families um, and their ability to get care. Um, and the cost, uh, and the cost shifting that we have um, allowed um, to individuals away from a system that is, is well funded. I think if you look at page seven of the, the, the A2 and the duties of the commission, you will see um, perhaps some of what you are describing um, and asking that we take a look at where and how uh, these big these big systems are driving many of the decisions using instruments that maybe aren't meant to provide care but to deny care. Uh, the role of private equity. Um, I, I, I do think that the, the financial drivers of a system that aren't necessarily borne by us or driven by us are making a lot of the decisions that close, close systems like what's happening in Coon Rapids without proper input or even evaluation for what it means for a community. Um, it does feel like uh, there are powerful entities and, uh, you know, they, they are powerful entities. Uh, it is not that they don't exist and it's not that they shouldn't exist, but where is the check on the power to make sure that Minnesotans are getting what they need? I think Minnesotans at a table taking a look at that and having a better understanding and telling us this is what we see. This is what we're worried about. This is what we believe should be fixed. Will help us. Uh, I've always had a lot of faith in Minnesotans, and they're not living their lives thinking what's the public, public policy that's going to work for us. But they are voicing pretty clearly uh, their frustration with, their concern about, uh, and their experiences with a healthcare system that isn't necessarily meeting their needs, depending on who you are, where you live your ethnicity, your race, your wealth. Um, and those are things that I think we should pay attention to. And as I have served in the legislature for all of these years, regardless of our ideology or our party or where we live, those are things that we have shared together that we want to make sure we're delivering on. Um, so I want, to give, I want to give Minnesotans that opportunity again. I want to push that door open one more time like Jim Koppel said we should and see if we can find a better path forward, knowing as I watch this committee last session, this session, wrestling with these issues. It's not for a lack of effort on the part of us. It's not for a lack of effort on the part of providers. But it does feel like the decision making that is happening around us is influencing significantly what's happening to Minnesotans. That's what I want us to put our hands on again. 
Um, I have other I, I, people. I know there's more people, yeah, but I so. just want to. Senator Abler. You know, this, this deserves the most amount of discussion we could ever have. And, you know, Senator Wickland, you got a huge agenda today. This is something you could spend the whole day on this thing and next week because it's that big a deal. And what you hope for, Senator Murphy, is wholly amazing. Um, but just to remind you, we, you and I have been on several reform efforts. And I chaired a subcommittee of one of those. I don't remember what year it was, um, with the senator from Rochester. Um, and anyway, um, anyway, so we sat there, and we had a, the room was full of people like this. And there's 98 people in the room watching the interests of their client and two reformers. And so I just want to caution you to be careful, to with hypocritical, don't make some things worse for the people that are trying so hard, the clinicians, the hospitals. I would go after the corporate entities, go after the PBMs, go after the people that are doing the insurance choices, both the uh, you know, HMOs and the regular ones. That's where the money is, that's where the power is, that's where the decisions happen. But just to be careful with those who are in the interface with, with the patients themselves, it's not them. Thank you. Other members have questions or comments? Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, because first off, I'll, I've got a few different questions, but for Senator Murphy, I don't see anything in this bill. I see where the looks like the funding may come to an end, but when would this commission sunset? I believe this commission would end. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, the, the commission would essentially end in 2027. Senator Adkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and so uh, that's when the money runs out, so that's when it, it, it just didn't say that part of it. So anyhow, um, I look at a lot of the things that this includes. And number one, um, I guess is, and I've heard the comment here earlier, I mean, my question would be, how would this bill or this commission save lives? I just don't see any in there that's going to do anything different other than probably cause some small operators to say the heck with doing anything that results in a payment from the state um, whether it's a an insurance agent um, you know you've got here the producers agents brokers anybody that uh, touches anything with health insurance you're going to have some small um, providers that uh, in the medical field that's they already, in a lot of cases, say, I'm not taking Medicaid patients because of, uh, whether it's the low reimbursements or everything else. Um, this just gives them one more reason to say no. Um, so I just don't see anything here um, that's a positive in, in trying to come up with a solution to what uh, some people call a problem. but. Uh, um, I just, I, I, I see a lot of challenges in this that uh, um, I think are unintended, and I, I would wish we were going down a different road if, you know, we already heard that, you know, a lot of this data is already available. Um, why are we empowering the state auditor to get now not, would have the ability to knock on doors and say, I want to see your books. Um, I just don't think that's needed. So um, with that, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that, Senator Atkey. Perhaps we see uh, the system through a different lens. Um, what, I, what I have been hearing from Minnesotans uh, from all over the state uh, is how expensive the system has become, that they may have coverage, but they can't afford or access care. Um, I think that is a systemic problem and not an individual problem. I do think that there are all sorts of entities that are participating within the system. You know, a decade ago, we worked on legislation to create a competitive bidding system for educators uh, as they, in their school districts, work to secure uh, effective and affordable health care coverage. And that work of a decade ago has been pretty much upended uh, by the system that continues to try, really, to make money 
Um, and that's, that's their interest. But the result of that is a competitive bidding system that is no longer functioning. Brokers are making more money. Educators are paying much more again for their health care insurance, and so are local property taxpayers. And that is a system, that is a, that is a theme uh, that I've seen repeated over and over again in my tenure. Um, that we do good work, we reform, we bring novel ideas, uh, we put them in place, they work for a while, they get upended by the system. Um, and Minnesotans are the ones who are paying the price for that. So I will work with you um, to make this work in a way that you see fit and that I see fit. Um, but this isn't really about any individual, but instead about a system. And our responsibility is for a system that delivers care. That is ours. And we put a lot of public money into the system, uh, whether it is tax breaks for employers who provide coverage, um, whether it is the payments and reimbursements and grants to providers, or the reinsurance that is holding up the individual market. Um, we put a lot of public money into a system. And that's Minnesotans' money. They're not getting that much for it. Many, many are not um, getting what they think they need and deserve in their communities. I think that's a problem that we should pay attention to. And I have a lot of faith in the people of Minnesota and believe if we can ask them to look at this, um, that we can find a path forward. Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to follow up on that a little bit. Um, we talk about how expensive it is, et cetera. I spent most of my life paying for my own insurance. Um, and I can go back a number of years ago, and it was not a big deal. Today it's a big deal. And it's because of, at least from the way I see it, it's a lot of what takes place in rooms like this here in Minnesota and across the country. Um, we haven't made things better with all the different things that have been added and adjusted. I mean, um, whether it's, it's the Affordable Care Act or the Minsure that came into place, all these things have added cost. Um, and the mandates and all these things that when we get in the middle of the business operation between the doctors and the patient and everything else, um, Government has been part of that problem, and I think we need to back off and take a look at this and how can we do things better. And by adding more levels of paper and requirements and reporting is not helping the bottom line and providing care and access to care. We, we hear those stories and realize that they are a challenge. Um, but a lot of what I see go happening is not helping that issue, and uh, I would hope that we could take, I think we all understand what the issue is, we just have different ways of getting there. And hopefully we can have the conversation um, from all sides. And uh, because in the end, I think, like you mentioned, Minnesotans do understand what's going on and have hopes for a better outcome. And hopefully we can help them achieve that. But. Uh, um, I just think we need to look at some other areas, too, and so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Senator Murphy. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed how you started the conversation on this bill. You started talking about prior authorization, and uh, I'm actually a co-author on the bill. Um, it's a pretty strange thing for uh, bipartisan support on some things that affect uh, health care especially, because we always look at things very differently. Um, my concerns with this bill is it's the exact opposite of function of what the prior auth bill is trying to do. The prior auth bill is an elimination of red tape. It, it's, you know, the prior auths have been a significant amount of red tape through health insurance uh, for, for a long time now. Um, we're looking at reducing the strain on providers with that bill. We're looking at uh, increasing access to care. Uh, I read this bill and the, I, I get a knee-jerk reaction as a, as a health care <coughs> provider myself who owns my own clinic. Um, the first thing I see is a, another version of the IRS, basically. You're giving a significant amount of power to the auditor to basically look into what my clinic is doing on a day-to-day -day basis and not only look into it, but require me to report it 
uh, every day or every every year just to recertify. Um, that's, that's a lot of red tape you're adding to the list of things that I now have to do as a small clinic. Um, I, I actually have dropped healthcare insurance providers because of the amount of red tape that they require. Um, and so when I read this, the first thing I'm going to do is exactly what Senator Utke already re, you know, reported is that a lot of clinics are going to go, uh, well, why, what's the point? Why am I going to take the, the state aid then at that point? Um, Senator Abler referenced, you know, we, we don't even get paid enough to cover the cost of seeing that patient. We're just seeing the patient because we care. Um, and so now, now we're worried about, okay, on top of that, it's going to be another cost. Um, we're increasing the cost to the provider by doing this. Um, so I, I don't think we can liken this to the to prior auth bill at, at, at all, to be honest. It's, it's actually the opposite. It's functioning as a, a, another line of red tape for those small clinics to have to deal with. Um, I think our rural providers especially went, I, I'm actually talking to a medical doctor who might possibly join my clinic to help increase rural providership. We lost our clinic in, in Lonsdale. We no longer have a medical provider in my small town. Um, and with that being said, this type of stuff is going to make it that much harder for him to start a clinic in my town. Um, and so I, I can see what your goal is. Your goal is to improve healthcare. It's, it's to look into it, to have a solution. But just looking for the solution by creating an, a, a new commission, I, I don't know if that's going to solve your problem. Um, and so with that, I definitely, I'm not, I'm not in support of this. And so I, I'm sorry for that. Um, thank you. Members, any other members who would wish to comment? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Murphy. I, I think you're on to something here, Madam Majority Leader. Um, I'm just looking at, you know, I met a young person the other day who wants to get her MBA with a special, specializing in health, the business of health care, which I thought was fascinating because that is a thing now. People are making a lot of money off the business of health care. And somewhere along the way, we've, we've lost our way in health care. We are spending more and more money, and Americans, Minnesotans and Americans are, are less well. We're getting sicker. So we're doing something wrong, clearly. I'm just looking, and I think um, Senator Abler referenced this in his comments. Uh, there's an article in the New York Times two days ago about this uh, business called, what's it called? Multiplan. Um, which is um, one of these genius little middlemen who, uh, let's see, they're, it's a private equity-backed firm that has helped drive down payments to medical providers, drive up patients' bills, and earn billions for insurers. That seems like really that's not doing any good for anyone other than the shareholders and the executives of that company. And I think your bill would help to get at some of that. I think clearly we need some we need some efforts on the national level, um, but in the meantime, gathering information in Minnesota, um, I think is important. I'm sympathetic to some of my Republican colleagues' comments about uh, providers um, and increasing bureaucracy and red tape, um, but we've got to get to the bottom of this. We need to rethink how we're paying for and delivering health care um, for people. So thank you for your effort. Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Murphy, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Uh, I feel like a broken record because I say this like every other day, but our healthcare system doesn't work. Um, and it makes me uh, upset, right, that we don't have the political will to stand here together as a group and say we must change it. Um, and, and I fear that they will come, but only when a family member of someone sitting up here dies because of the lack of care, because of delayed care, because of unaffordable care. It's coming. Um, when you have a for-profit healthcare system, nothing prevents the large handful of systems that own 80% of our healthier industry to consolidate, to increase profit margins at the expense of people because that's what businesses do. And we allow healthcare to run as businesses in America and in the state of Minnesota. So, it, it wasn't the ACA that broke healthcare. It wasn't people in rooms like this that broke health care. It was allowing larger systems to get larger and larger and take up more money and decrease patient care and increase profits. That's what's breaking health care. Um, 
The other thing that makes me angry is that when we say, show us where the money is, people come up with 101 reasons why they cannot do that. It's just, just not going to work. Um, so I'm glad to hear that nonprofit hospitals are already doing a lot of this work because it'll make it less burdensome for them to comply with this law. Um, so thank you, Senator Murphy, for trying to, to, to give us some clarity and transparency because it's not right for large organizations to come to the state and say, we need more money, we need more money, and then they buy hospitals and close them down. That's not right. So to see where that money is going is incredibly important. So thank you for your work. Senator Murphy, any, um, any other member comments before? Oh, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, um, just based on something that we just heard, I, I don't think that this bill is going to drastically affect those heavily consolidated businesses. Uh, they have margins that can support this type of legislation. I'm worried about the small businesses. I'm worried about the small clinics, the independent clinics. They cannot afford something like this. Uh, that is the reason that consolidation is happening, and that is my concern with this bill. You're talking about more clinics looking towards consolidation because they cannot afford this type of legislation. Thank you. And Madam Chair. And Senator Murphy. Senator Liskey. I don't think consolidation is happening for those reasons. I think consolidation is happening with intention. Um, and I think those that are consolidating are thinking about their book of work, their bottom line, but not necessarily about Minnesotans. And it is the small clinics and the small providers and the independents who are being eaten up, and it's not just by purchasing, it's by networking. It's by financial instruments that are being used by the system to achieve that goal. And I think Minnesotans are wondering what the heck is happening. Um, they know it because they're experiencing it, but they don't have their hands on it. So let's put them in that seat so they can help us figure it out. I think you and I probably share concern about what's happening. Um, so you know, I'm happy to work with you to make this uh, bill something that you see that is functional. Um, I'm happy to work with you on that. But I don't want us to leave this legislature um, going out back into Minnesota without taking a, taking a real effort, making an effort to say it's, it's not working and we gotta figure something out. And again, as I've said before, I have faith in Minnesotans, I have faith in us, uh, but I have faith in Minnesotans that if given the tools and the platform to take a look at the ways in which the system is now working, but not for them, that they'll help us figure out how to turn that around. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Um, I appreciate you bringing the bill forward. I think it continues a theme that we have been exploring in this committee. You know, last session um, we had opportunity to hear and discuss ways that we thought would get at some of the uh, concerns and issues. Uh, we put actually passed some um, some ways to try to start to get at, you know, understanding um, how much we're spending, why are we, or where is it going, um, are we getting the most value from the money that we spend. And so I appreciate your bringing this bill forward to introduce another way to get others involved in hearing about, you know, what are the concerns and what are some ways that we could address those concerns. Um, and I, we could have a very, continue to have more discussion. It's a very um, complex topic and I appreciate um, your, your willingness to keep working on the language and, and see what we can come up with um, for this session. Uh, this bill um, needs to go to the Judiciary Committee. Um, so members, if there aren't other questions or comments, um, Senator Murphy, did you have any final comments? I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you very much and I hope to earn your support. Thank you. Um, and with that, um, Senator Mann moves that Senate file 1745 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. The motion does prevail. Senate file 1745 as amended does pass and is referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Senator Murphy. Um, Senator Bolden, we are going to try to quickly fill in your bill. 
And members, just to let you know, now we are moving, and, and for the audience as well, we are moving to a series of five bills that are um, bills that we wanted to fit in before we do our work to um, assemble the omnibus. Uh, but we aren't, we really have very limited time because we do have also to hear today the Office of Cannabis, Cannabis Management Bill and the Governor's um, Supplemental Budget Bill. So I would ask that each of you keep your, um, each of these bills um, to the five minute time limit. And Senator Bolden, first we have Senate File 4170. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be brief with my comments, and we do have one testifier. So this bill uh, would allocate $1 million to DHS for early childhood mental health consultation grants. These uh, grants would, would go towards mental health prevention. Uh, it's focused on support for infant and young children's emotional development to prevent, identify, and reduce mental health challenges, something uh, we know is uh, happening across our state. Uh, outcomes from this program would decrease mental health issues in children, decrease educational disparities in kids of color, and increase the competence and confidence of early learning uh, staff to address trauma, adversity, and mental health challenges. So in a, in a space where we are seeking ways to uh, support mental health issues across our state, investing in a program that will do that with our littlest Minnesotans uh, is an is a excellent way to do that, to prevent issues before they begin. Thank you. And we have a testifier who is coming by way of Zoom, uh, Leah Budnick. Uh, if you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yes, uh, Chair Wickland, Lead Utke, and members of the committee. My name is Leah Budnick. I'm the founder of the Lake Superior Zoo School, a preschool program embedded in the Lake Superior Zoo in Duluth. Thank you for providing the time to testify in support of SF 4170. My experience with mental health consultation services began in January of 2022, just after I returned to zoo school from maternity leave. The school had been operating since September of 2020, and frankly, it was exhausting. Uh, we had students with significant social emotional delays and extremely challenging behaviors. While I was on maternity leave, I received a call from one of my teachers saying she couldn't do it anymore. She simply could not keep the other children safe she wasn't sleeping, um, and so we decided with heavy hearts to disenroll the child who was struggling. When I returned from maternity leave, my teachers and the students were still shaken by the experience. Teachers felt that they had failed the child that we expelled. They also felt that they had failed to maintain the physical and emotional safety of other students. I talked to my parent aware coach about the situation, and she referred us to the mental health consultation program. I met with our mental health consult consultant individually, and then we met during an all staff training day to process what had occurred as a group. We were vulnerable together, we mourned, and we learned strategies to cope with our grief together. It's not easy to say goodbye to a student and their family that you loved dearly and supported for over a year, but we had to accept what happened and move on because we had more children to care for. My teachers continued to meet with our mental health consultant regularly. This support helped us to meet the needs of another child with a history of trauma, social emotional delays, and challenging behaviors, and then another child and another. I'm proud to say that we retained all of our zoo school teachers. Zoo school has not expelled any more children. And most importantly, the teachers are more equipped to support children with social emotional delays and trauma and their families. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, members, do you have any questions or comments about the bill? Senator Kupak. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll keep it really brief. Um, have Thank you, Senator Bolden. I've definitely heard from, you know, health uh, child care providers in my area that, that kids are coming into preschool with more and more mental health issues. So I think anything we can do to help them um, get through those challenges is a good thing. So thanks. Thank you. Any other members, questions, comments? Seeing none, thank you, Senator Boland. Any final thoughts? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Thank you for the consideration. Thank you. And with that, um, Senate File 4170 will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. 
Next on the agenda, we have Senator Kunesh. Welcome to the committee. And first, we have Senate File 4992. And I believe, um, Senator Kunish, you have, uh, there is an A2 amendment. Um, and would you like to have us adopt that as an author's amendment? Yes, please. Um, Senator Mann moves the A2 amendment. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The A2 amendment is adopted. Senator Kunish. Wonderful. Um, members, in front of you, you have Senate File 4992. Um, this allocates $350,000 to the Commissioner of Health to develop a grant that distributes money to the uh, Native American Community Clinic that will improve access to culturally centered prenatal and postpartum care. The clinic will be required to release an implementation report at the end of the fiscal year, um, and this bill aims to be uh, to decrease the racial disparities in birth outcomes. It empowers and supports our indigenous communities, and it provides robust support networks tailored to the unique cultural needs of the indigenous community. Uh, it, um, I just want to point out that the Birth Justice Collaborative has come out in support of this bill, and um, they have uh, uh, supported this bill, mostly importantly because of the, um, the uh, um, issues around maternal care and uh, mortality for our indigenous people. And so with that, I would like to um, invite my testifiers up to share their, their testify. Thank you. Um, I have Anthony, Anthony Stately, please. Welcome to the committee and um, please state your name for the record and then begin your testimony. Thank you, Senator Nurbuckman. Um, my name is Dr. Anthony Stately um, and um, I'm from the Native American Community Clinic and also uh, um, lead partner in the Birthing Justice Center, or collaborative rather. Um, Buju Chair Wickland and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Anthony Stately. I'm the executive officer and president of the Native American Community Clinic, a federally qualified health care center that provides comprehensive primary care, dental care, and behavioral health services to the Twin Cities diverse Native American community located in South Minneapolis. I'm here as a lead partner of the Birthing Justice Collaborative, which is led by American Indian and American Indian, um, American Indian, African American organizations, African American organizations that are in partnership with the Hennepin County. The Birthing Justice Collaborative is focused on co-designing strategies to improve birth outcomes for their communities, focused on cultural practices and knowledge coupled with the research. We strongly support SF, uh, Senate File um, 4992. It's a planning grant for the development of an American Indian focused birthing center, which will be co-led by several key um, native-led organizations in the Twin Cities, including Native American Community Clinic, Division of Indian Work, Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center, and the Minnebizarwin uh, Wellness Clinic, which is um, operated by the Red Lake Nation. We believe it is critically important to provide Native women and birthing people a place to seek prenatal care and deliver their babies in a culturally affirming, affirmative setting <clears throat> Excuse me. who are leading um, with these practices. Having access to an American Indian birthing center um, can help mitigate generational harms that have been done against indigenous women and their families for um, significant um, numbers of generations. Mm -hmm. Too many of our birthing stories end and, and, and in tragedy. 8% of pregnancy associated deaths are of American Indian birthing people, despite representing only 2% or less of the population. Um, we believe we can define our future through the engagement of our community members and the planning process to bring our traditional cultural practices into the pregnancy and postpartum experiences of Native women and families. We would appreciate your support for this important planning grant. Chimigwich. Thank you very much. Well, members, do you have any questions or comments about this bill? Senator Rodkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my question for the author is just, uh, and actually, she's got two bills up in a row, and the, the, it would be the same on both. This is, uh, would be giving a grant to the Birth Justice Collaborative, 
But then you mentioned the Native American clinic. I'm sure there's going to be a different clinic on the next bill. What is the working relationship between those organizations due to the fact that we've got one name here and probably another one's going to carry out the mission? Thank you so much. So, pardon me. Um, thanks for the question. They, this is um, a very tight-knit, uh, collaborative, uh, coordinated effort to address the, the maternity issues. Um, the, uh, the Birth Justice Collaborative works within the community to uh, inform and support uh, our, our communities of color but it's the clinics that actually help do the work. And so we need to have those boots on the ground sort of folks, and then we need to have the experts such as um, Dr. Stately here and the clinic and the, the services that he provides to actually do those sort of things. And if Dr. Stately has any kind of response, I'm happy to sure. hear from Dr. Can, Stately. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McClellan. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Um, I can, one of the things that I want to just express here is that the Birthing Justice Collaborative is made up of six Native organizations and um, African American organizations that are nonprofits that actually deliver care in the community. So we formed this collaborative in 2022. Um, we also work with um, Collective Action Lab um, administratively, who supports the collaborative. Um, it's important, they play a really important role in the collaborative because. All six organizations have other work that we do. This is kind of on top of the work that we typically do and, and our day-to-day -day operations in terms of our care and our delivery of services to the community. Um, this is a really important set of bills because um, African American women and Native American women have significantly disparate rates of maternal and child uh, mortality that is outstrips the rest of the um, of um, the state of Minnesota in terms of racial and ethnic diversity. Um, in, the, in the Hennepin County specifically, um, that, um, that, grow, that number grows even more significantly. Um, so um, the nonprofits that are part of the collaborative are the people that will do the work and help guide the work. And um, we, are, we collectively form the collaborative. So the collaborative is just the name of the six organizations that do the work. Senator Utke, is that? Okay. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Kunish, for bringing this forward, both these bills forward. Um, I'm proud to be a, a co-author on this one. You know, the maternal morbidity and mortality crisis um, that is impacting our Native American and African American communities is an American tragedy and a Minnesota tragedy, and it's not one that we can look away from. We have to engage. And as we learn more about the importance of culturally competent, culturally congruent care, um, we have data and evidence to back that up. I think this is a really exciting project. It's a relatively tiny investment with potentially really big returns. Um, so I'm really excited about this work. Um, thank you, doctor, for being here and for your work as well. Thank you. Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and I appreciate the, the bill. The uh, disparities are just horrible. We've been talking about this since I got here. Uh, I'm not sure if we've cracked it very well. Um, so, just have a question for you, Doctor. Um, you know, not everybody's going to get to go to your collaborative. Do you have other like best practices that you've noticed and are able to in your when they come into your you know care in, in the people that you're working with? Sure. Are the outcomes better than they would be con expected elsewhere? Yeah, I think one of Dr. the. Dr. Staley. Yes, thank you so much. Sorry. Um, thank you so much for asking that question. I think it's really important to note that. Um, <clears throat> So NAC, um, under my leadership over the last seven years, we built out a traditional healing program and um, that is fairly robust now. We started with one or two um, traditional healers that sort of worked for us part-time. They now work for us full-time. That number of traditional healers has grown from two to five. Um, <clears throat> in our traditional healing team, we have two um, um, women who have also been trained as um, doulas and also um, birthing doulas and also as not lactation experts. Um, one of the things that we are seeing significantly in our own clinic, just anecdotally, um, it's based on our data, our own internal data, but we're seeing a significant um, 
uptick in women who are coming to us for prenatal care and for um, uh, postnatal care after the child is born because we have a robust support system. Like we're one little tiny clinic and we only have two providers and um, we don't have a lot of bandwidth to be able to do that. But one of the things we hear consistently is that Native women are reluctant to go to larger health systems where they don't feel um, as comfortable, they don't feel as, they feel a sense of discrimination, um, they are anxious about um, uh, the their own family's history of having been treated poorly in large health systems where they um, need to go to see a gynecologist or um, our OBGYN. So some of this is, um, the purpose of this is to give Native women um, another place where they can get culturally con um, uh, congruent care and also um, sensitive care so that they actually seek prenatal care and they are able to give birth to healthy babies and then they are supported after birth for up to 12 months so that they um, so that they can um, stay alive. The data will f reflect if we look at it closely um, in Hennepin County. The majority of deaths among um, Native women um, specifically happen within six to nine months after they give birth, um, and a majority of those um, um, conditions can are, are significantly pre preventable. I think 100% of them are actually preventable um, with good competent care. Then, Senator, yeah, sure. Senator Abler. Well, I, that's you know great to hear. But as you know, as, as policymakers, we um, hope to export great ideas into the system. And so, the, if you were here for the, the first bill up, you know what's not working. Um, yeah. I, I think you have part of the answers to what's not working in this little niche. And I think that as, as we can export the successes and what you've come to understand uh, into a system. People who aren't able to get into your, you know, uh, clinic uh, of Native Americans and African Americans with the disparities could actually be improved. So, mm -hmm. Senator Kunish, as this thing goes, maybe you want to kind of find a way to feed back in. And so, I mean, we have the U, which trains our most of the doctors in the state. Uh, uh, you know, they could import. They're always looking. Hopefully, they're looking for better ideas. And so, I just encourage you in that. So, so thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Kunish, for bringing a topic that has been part of, well, the United States and Minnesota for many, many years, or it should be, right? And, and Madam Chair, I think you're going to see this in the next presentation, too, is part of Title V maternal child health block grant programs. Every five years, Minnesota um, is required to compete, complete this comprehensive um, assessment on the health and well-being of children, families, and, and you know, others, right? And I can go into detail. But 11 priorities um, have been listed from the 2020 assessment. And, and the work they're doing is one of those priorities. Actually, there's two of their priorities. One is disparities. The other one is the maternal child health piece of it. And it just, I'm wondering if, if the Department of Health, which is already, I mean, it is a thick assessment that's done, and you've seen those Title V public health plans that are done, but the 11 priorities, if this activity and the activity of the next group that's coming in is, fits within there, maybe the conversation should be, why isn't the Department of Health folks, Title V folks working with you, or maybe they already are, but I see this, the work you're doing, doctor, is absolutely spotlighted. It should be spotlighted. And, you know, if it's, I should go and read the assessment of the state to see if your stuff is spotlighted in there. But I think there's an opportunity here for us to go on something we know that is being successful and working in what he's doing. And, and there's already that um, infrastructure that's in place to make it a systemic move. And so uh, it's more of a, a, a comment or a um, encouragement to Senator Kunish to, and, and if you've already done that, just please stop me and say, yes, you know, John, we've already been talking with the folks, and if not, let's go. So thank you for bringing this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member questions or comments? Any final thoughts, Senator Kunish? 
I, I think it's important to notice that this is a very modest request for something that is so mon monumental. Um, when we ask why isn't the Department of Health or why aren't we doing these if this is best practices, you know, historically we know that uh, there's been a lack of investment in um, in Indian country when it comes to health and, and especially our uh, women and children. And um, I would ask that you would please consider this as a incredible and modest investment, but it's going to have a huge return on that investment and could act as that everybody is saying, why aren't we doing this? Well, this could be the model to, to expand in the best way. Thank you, um, Dr. Steely. Thank you. If I could just make a comment about the, um, on that as well. Um, I want to point out to um, the members of the committee and to the, um, and all the legislators in the audience um, <clears throat> that Minnesota and uh, across the state of the United States, the Twin Cities has the largest and densest, most um, oh, yeah. urban population of American Indians in the country. Um, more Native people live in Hennepin County and specifically in South Minneapolis um, in the densest population map than anywhere else in the United States in an urban environment. 60% of your Native American people in the state of Minnesota do not live on tribal land. They live in, in, in urban centers like Minneapolis and St. Paul. And so one of this bill is especially specifically addressing the needs of indigenous women, um, not all who are members of the 11 nations. Um, the state has a government a government relationship with tribal nations. And so the work we do sometimes where we invest in those tribal nations is important. But a lot of the times the native people that live in urban areas that I serve, they don't get those resources because we are not paying attention to the people who are actually living in those areas. And so this is a bill that is intended to specifically serve native women who are living in, um, in, in the urban core in the South Minneapolis um, or Hennepin County specifically. But we're hoping that this birthing center will serve everybody in the state and serve as a model to um, how to do culturally competent care and help save lives. Thank you very much for that additional information and thank you for bringing forward the work that you're doing. It, it's really important and um, I, I think that this, as has been mentioned, is a, is a modest way of trying to invest in things that we see are working. Um, we will take it into consideration, and we have a very, um, very small budget, unfortunately, this week, this session to work with. Um, but I really appreciate your bringing this forward, Senator Kunish. And, and um, with that, um, Senate File 4992, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in, in an omnibus bill. Thank, Thank, you, so you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next, Senator Kunish, you have Senate File 5171. Yes, and I do have the A1 amendment as well. Um, members, you have that in your packet, and um, Senator Mann moves the A1 amendment. Uh, members, all those in f favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Kunish. Thank you so much, um, Chair Wicklin and members of the committee. Um, I'm also pleased to offer this companion bill um, that will also um, provide assistance for uh, to address the persistent and widening disparity in Minnesota's maternal health and birth outcomes, much like uh, the bill that you heard previously for our um, African-American uh, community. Um, while they only make up 13% of the birthing population in Minnesota, they act, there actually are 23% of the pregnancy-associated deaths. Minnesota's Department of Health's first maternal mater Maternal mortality report examined maternal deaths that occurred during or within one year of pregnancy, and their co-chair determined that 100% of those deaths were preventable. And we heard that from Dr. Stately as well. Um, but what they really needed to do, what, what needed to happen is that patients had um, access to adequate pre and post delivery services and preventative care in order to prevent 
100% of those deaths. We know that if left untreated, the ongoing impact of slavery and historic trauma will continue to be fatal for African American communities, and the home place reimagines how families learn about, navigate, and access care and family services by acting as a single entry point for pregnant people and their families to find culturally appropriate care, healing, and community. Um, I actually agreed to support both of these pieces of legislation because they build on the important work of the committee uh, in order to empower communities to identify solutions that will improve health outcomes and interrupt racial health inequities at the point of care. And I would greatly uh, appreciate, once again, the support uh, from this committee, and I do have a testifier. Thank you. Um, and we have Pastor Alika Galloway. If you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. My name is Reverend Dr. Alika Galloway. Chair Wicklin and members of the committee, as I said, I am Reverend Dr. Alika Galloway, and I am an African-American mother of two daughters who barely survived birth. Sorry. And they are mothers of seven children who are almost always afraid of giving additional birth. I am here to put a face on these alarming statistics. My daughters, my granddaughters, and my great-granddaughters have suffered from this disparity and have suffered from this trauma and terrorism that can be prevented on a daily basis. African-American birthing parents, African-American women, and their children are dying at an alarming rate, and we should all be concerned about it. I am also the co-founder of the Northside Healing Space and the lead partner of the Birth Justice Collaboration. I am here to testify in support of Senate File 5171, and I am one of the planning grants collaborators at, to support an African-American focused home place and urban retreat center that will support the families and birthing people in our community, especially through the birth and postpartum period of their birthing experience. My birth justice colleagues and I, Reverend Sarita and Makeda Zulu, the executive director of the University of Minnesota, UROC, are both birth mothers, and both of them um, birthed two children, while birth, both of them suffered from postpartum and prenatal issues that could have led to their death. The trauma again and terror of giving birth as an African-American birthing person is often talked about behind closed doors, but it is time that the conversation be common knowledge. And as an equitable community, we must address this issue. At the Northside Healing Space, we are deeply rooted in evidence-based curriculum evidence-based community wisdom, and evidence-based ancient healing practices and participatory action research. We believe that an African-American home place urban retreat center is where families will increase their odds of survival. It is an effective strategy that has deep cultural roots created to address the racial disparities in our community and in our homes. Home Places reimagined how families access support during pregnancy and family care by acting as a single entry point for pregnant people and their families to learn about and access care, services, and cultural community healing, including community-based birth workers, mental health services, cultural parenting groups, storytelling, grief work, food, and community education classes. As an evidence-based collaborative, we know untreated historical and generational trauma leads to death and increased negative health outcomes. By centering families, our culture, and the health and healing of our community, we believe, no, we know that the home place model will interrupt racial disparities at the point of care so that our babies and our parents can live. Please support 
Senate File 5171 for a grant to create a replicable home place model to support our families during this critical period. I am happy now to answer any questions and to thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, members, do you have any questions or comments? You have. I don't see any any questions. Um, we are running very short on time, and I, I really appreciate your coming today to, to provide the testimony. It does seem like a, another very um, very well thought out um, approach, and really making a meaningful difference. And I hope that we can give it consideration as we as we go forward. Um, definitely appreciate being able to hear uh, firsthand from you. You know what what is important about um, about the work you do and um, the importance of this grant. So, Senator Kunish, any final thoughts? No, thank you for listening in, um, intently and intentionally. And I would encourage you to all take a look at this handout that I think you have. It, it just lays everything out very clearly and um, just reiterates the, the really importance of, of the funding for these two issues. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And with that, um, Senate File 5171, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you very much. Next, we have Senator Mann. And so we have two more uh, short bills. I know they aren't small bills, but they're, we need to um, keep the time short as possible because we do have the um, Office of Cannabis Management bill to take up yet. So, Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we've had many conversations about children's mental health and boarding crisis, uh, and we know that there's not one silver bullet to fix the problem. So what Senate File 4664 provides is a framework to create a system that actually works for children and families across Minnesota. Um, it allows us to intervene early, provide the right care at the right time by the right staff in the right setting, uh, and prevent many of the crises that force children and families to seek emergency care in hospitals. Uh, I'll also note that Chair Wicklund's bill to increase Medicaid inpatient and outpatient mental health rates is foundational to the solution, uh, so I want to uplift that bill as well. But this bill uh, invests in respite and intensive in-home care for families, creates a Medicaid benefit for children's residential crisis stabilization, provides continuing grants to organizations that help move children from boarding to community-based care, and provides stable funding for school-linked mental health grants. Um, it is possible to build a system that works if we invest in the right places, Madam Chair. I do have testifiers, but in the sake of time, they've agreed to uh, just be available for questions unless you want them to testify. Thank you, Senator Mann. I guess I would appreciate it if we, if we can. Um, I know that there are many components to your bill, and they are some of them are things that we have had a chance to talk about in past, you know, in past um, opportunities. Um, I don't want to shortchange the importance. I think this is a really important bill and has. Um, members, as members can see, there are many letters of support for the bill and the components within it. So we will be examining the bill, you know, for possible elements that we can extract um, this session. But members, do you have any questions, Senator Rodkey? Thank you, Madam. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just have one, just clarification on page two. Um, lines 2.8 and 2.9, where it says counties must work to provide regular access to regularly scheduled respite care. Is that, I mean, when it's new language, it jumps out as maybe a new mandate, but is that something they're already doing? It's just clarifying it, or could you just clarify the question, I guess? Thank you. Senator Mann. Madam Chair, I think uh, Kristen, Kirsten Anderson would be best to answer that question on Zoom. And Kirsten is on Zoom. Um, if you can, um, Kirsten, if you Chair? heard the question, if you can state your name for the record and answer. Yeah, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Kirsten Anderson. I'm with the Spire, Minnesota. And Senator, a key to your question. Yeah, that language, um, again, this bill was brought together by the Monopoly Legislative Network, and that language is simply, I think, to, to provide intent around the frequency of respite. Respite is, of course, an incredibly valuable element for kids and families, provides an opportunity to 
allow for a real break that could sustain critically important care. And simply the goal of this grant that is distributed by the counties is to create the highest level of flexibility, but also um, as is, is reflected here with the goal of consistency for the purposes of that sustained care. Senator Rutke, okay. Any other questions, comments? Um, seeing no other questions or comments right now, Senator Mann, any final thoughts? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we will, as I said, we will um, lay this over and um, consider portions of the bill. Um, Senate file 4664 is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. And now Senator Kupek. Senate file 3737. Senator Kupak. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll uh, speed this one along, too. If Senator Mann can do that as fast. This one's a lot shorter than hers. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is Senate File 3737, uh, which would appropriate one-time general fund dollars to support the continuation of the very successful Child Care Facility Revitalization Grant. Uh, it was originally established in 2021 uh, and funded originally through the American Rescue Plan Act dollars of, uh, to, for facilities to revitalization grant program, uh, improve safety and quality of thousands of child care settings uh, across the state, and in doing so, uh, created 7,000 new child care child care slot. So these are grants that go out uh, to some to uh, in-home providers, things like providing fences, safety things, upgrading the facilities uh, to make sure that they uh, can accommodate more kids. So it's, uh, it's one more little piece of fixing that child care, uh, lack of child care that we have. I do have a testifier too. So. Thank you. Yeah. And welcome to the committee. And Ms. Pearl, if you could state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Suzanne Pearl. I'm the Minnesota Director for First Children's Finance. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity and thank Senator Kupek for authoring the bill. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you about the Minnesota Child Care Facility Revitalization Grants Program. All funds have now been granted and I'm here to share the successful results and why we believe it should continue. The program began with an appropriation from the 2021 legislative session using one-time American Rescue Plan Act funding. In designing the program and after engaging directly with child care providers, we wanted to ensure that funds were equitably and widely distributed. To that end, unlike other child care grant programs, funds are provided upfront rather than a reimbursement and do not require a match. And this is the first facility-focused state grant program that licensed family child care providers have been able to apply to directly without a fiscal agent. The program set an award cap of $20,000 for centers and $15,000 for licensed family child care. Tribally licensed child care was also eligible for this program at the same funding level per provider type. We held competitive grant rounds about every three months, eight rounds in total. Applications were evaluated based on how much the funds would impact health and safety of kids, whether they address licensing needs and the level of child care need in their location, among other factors. If awarded a grant, grantees received 90% of the award up front and they had six months to complete their projects. They then had to submit receipts, documentation, and photographic evidence of their completed project to receive the final 10% of their award. If they spent less than the full award or we discovered that some of the funds were used for ineligible items, they would not receive the 10% payment and or would be invoiced for the difference uh, from their initial 90% payment. We are happy to report that the grant compliance rate has been very high for this program. Of the more than 2,700 child care businesses who have received grants to date, only 24 have been referred to DHS for noncompliance. We also had an independent audit of the program done last fall, which was successfully completed with no findings. In total, we awarded more than $31.2 million to 2,725 unique child care businesses across Minnesota. The average grant award size was just over $9,000. 69% of grants went to family child care and 31% to, 31 to child care centers. 58% of grant dollars were awarded to businesses located in greater Minnesota, with 42% with awarded to businesses in the seven county metro. 
and across Minnesota, 15% of grants were awarded to childcare business owners who identified it as people of color. Grant funds were used for a variety of projects and equipment with the majority of funds used to repair or purchase flooring, fencing, outdoor play areas and play sets, appliances and windows. The total enrollment of the 2,725 childcare businesses receiving funds is more than 67,000 children. That's 67,000 Minnesota kids who are now benefiting from safer, healthier environments. This grant program also resulted in an increase of almost 7,000 new childcare slots, which is fairly amazing since due to federal regulation, we were not able to use the funds to build new facilities or expand the size of any existing facilities but these small grants had a big impact, helping childcare providers to make better use of their space so that they could increase enrollment within their license capacity. We are asking now for funding to continue the program on a smaller scale to provide grants for childcare programs who now and will continue to need support for facility repairs. This program complements and does not replicate other existing state supports, including the DEED Childcare Economic Development Grants and the Great Start Compensation Support Payments. The program provides equitable opportunity for all child care programs in Minnesota to ensure safe and healthy facilities for the children in their care. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, members, do you have any questions or comments? Well, thank you very much for describing the program so succinctly. And it really looks to me like it's an amazingly efficient program and has been able to do um, so much good and benefiting kids you know, all over the state. Um, and I appreciate that you've documented your results in a, a very nice um, report. Um, so we have that information as well. So any final thoughts, Senator Kupak? No, thanks. I, it, everything uh, she just said, it's, it's a really good program, and it's really well documented, and it, it's done a lot of good. So if we can continue it, it'll be great. Okay. Thank you very much, and we will consider it. And um, Senate File 3737 will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. So thank you very much. Yes. For um, and now we'll move to Senate File 4782. And Senator Port is with us on Zoom. Welcome to the committee, Senator Port. Good morning, Chair Wicklin and members. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present to your committee virtually. It's my honor to be here today to present Senate File 4782, the first ever Cannabis Management, Office of Cannabis Management Agency Bill. If you recall, last year we did historic work to start correcting the harms and failures of prohibition. Through the 2023 session, the bill was heard in 14 committees, took 65 amendments, and became one of the strongest cannabis laws in the nation. As I said then, and I will keep saying, it will not be the last time the legislature hears a cannabis bill. Prohibition of alcohol ended nearly 100 years ago, and we still hear liquor bills every session. This newly legalized and regulated industry is in its infancy, and we're here to continue the work that we started last year. In partnership with the brand new Office of Cannabis Management, this bill improves and streamlines the licensing process and supply chain. It strengthens our social equity goals, accelerates the transition of enforcement, infrastructure, and resources, and it expands protections for medical patients. The portions of this bill that fall within the committee's jurisdiction cover just a few main ideas. First, it accelerates the transfer of the Office of Medical Cannabis from MDH to OCM on July 1, 2024, and it makes the technical changes replacing references to the Division of Medical Cannabis with references to OCM. It also streamlines the supply chain for medical and recreational cannabis through the point of cultivation. It enhances patient access to medical cannabis, and it expands protections for individuals in the medical cannabis program and makes modifications. As always, I look forward to the discussion and future partnership with you all on this bill. Next, I'll turn it over to OCM Interim Director Charlene Breiner for some deeper insight to the agency recommendations. She and her staff are here to answer questions as well. Uh, but first, Madam Chair, I do have the A14 amendment. Um, yes, members, in your packet, you have the A14 amendment. Um, can you tell us, uh, can you, I don't know, kind of briefly tell us what components you're bringing in in the A14? Absolutely. 
Uh, the amendment represents remaining technical changes needed to ensure continuity as the medical cannabis program is moved from MDH to OCM. And the amendment also contains technical cannabis related language already included in the HHS omnibus policy bill in order to ensure that that work is reflected and that nothing becomes contradictory. Uh, members, any questions? Senator Abler. Well, thanks. Um, just on the medical cannabis stuff, um, I have two questions. Like the first one is, why do we care what we're having a list anymore since you can just get it for recreational purposes? And the second is, are, are we adding to the list or is this just a technical update? And by the way, it's nice to see you and I wish you were here in person, so. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. Um, we, these are just technical changes, uh, but as for why we still have the list, um, not everybody will be able to get or get recreational cannabis. Uh, for instance, medical cannabis is frequently used for children who have seizures. Um, so we need to make sure that um, medical cannabis continues to remain available um, and uh, like easily accessible by, by the patients who need it. Additionally, there are um, medical cannabis uh, treatments that are very, very specific in the kind of strain that's used and the dosage that's used, and those will not necessarily be available through the recreational program. So it is critical that we keep the medical program uh, functional and accessible to patients. Senator Abler. Thank you. That was helpful. Uh, members, any other questions about the amendment? Okay, we will move to adopt that. Um, Senator Mann moves the A14 amendment. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The amendment is, A14 amendment is adopted. Thank you. So we will move to testimony. Is that your preference? I hope. Yes, if um, Interim Director uh, Charlene Breiner uh, could present uh, for the agency. Uh, welcome to the committee, Ms. Breiner, and uh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and for the record, my name is Charlene Breiner. I'm currently serving as the Interim Director of the Office of Cannabis Management, and it's really good to be in front of you this morning. I want to thank you, Madam Chair and committee members, for the opportunity to join Senator Port to present these proposals, uh, especially the ones that are specific to this jurisdiction. Some members have heard other parts of OCM's uh, uh, bill in different committees, and so I want to limit uh, the conversation this morning to the very specific prov provisions that fall under your jurisdiction. Uh, to remind folks, uh, and for those of you who haven't heard this, we have two specific lenses that we have used uh, in developing our legislative recommendations. Number one, what do we need to have in place to launch the market in an effective and timely manner? And number two, what do we need in order to, to build and sustain effective regulatory uh, functions over time. Uh, specific to this jurisdiction, you can see there are three primary buckets of changes. One is a uh, change to the office structure, which accelerates, as Senator Port mentioned, the transition of the Office of Medical Can Cannabis to OCM. This was always envisioned to happen. We just move it up to uh, uh, be more consistent uh, and integrate earlier the foundational capacity that exists in that office. We want to streamline the supply chain and expand protections for medical patients and uh, make some modifications to the program. Uh, specific to the acceleration, current law, as I mentioned, already plans for the transfer of the Office of Medical Cannabis to OCM so that all things cannabis will be under one umbrella, including the hemp products and adult use cannabis as well as medical. We accelerate the, this transition um, as well as the temporary enforcement authority uh, for the hemp pro, uh, the hemp derived cannabinoid products that already is happening at MDH. Um, and there are several sections throughout the bill that address this proposal through technical changes to authority references and transfer language to support data and employees who are moving between agencies. And also by amending 15172 directly, we keep the current temporary regulations for in place for the hemp products while we continue to build OCM's regulatory and licensing structure. After adoption of OCM's rules, the hemp derived product retailers will transition to the licensing and enforcement structure under Chapter 342. All of these changes will result in earlier integration of staff and program activities, 
better consistency in our enforcement efforts. It will minimize disruption in operations and create better, pardon me, better continuity for patients uh, as we prepare for the transition from a registration system that exists at the Department of Health right now for the medical program to a full licensing system, as is called for in 342. And doing this earlier lays the groundwork for all of that to happen in a more seamless manner. Additionally, we recommend modifying the structure of the Office of Cannabis Management by replacing references to the Division of Medical Cannabis, which currently exists, with the office to indicate the Office of Cannabis Management. The plan is to retain the medical program in full and the division of work, but it's also very important for us to have the authority of Chapter 342 rest with our office in totality to maximize our, effort, our capacity and effectiveness. This change actually is what requires the dozens of technical changes that you see in front of you and is sort of misleading in terms of the complexity and scope of the bill. Um, Next, we recommend streamlining the supply chain to enhance patient access. We recommend consolidation of the currently separated medical and adult use supply chain at the point of cultivation into a single supply chain because cannabis is cannabis until you actually manufacture the specific products. This proposal comes directly from lessons we've learned in other states about creating conditions for operators to be successful in both the medical and adult use, adult use markets. Uh, as I mentioned, at the point of cultivation, there is no distinction between medical and adult use cannabis. The first place in the supply chain where we see any distinction is when manufacturers produce certain specialty products for, pardon me, for patients. And by removing that distinction at the point of cultivation, we're better able to reduce administrative burden for OCM, better able to help providers manage, manage front end costs, which consequently we anticipate will reduce prices for both patients and adult use consumers. We've also seen in other states that this merger happens organically if you don't do it uh, right from the beginning, and that can be very disruptive and additional cost for medical and uh, cultivators, and that cost gets uh, passed on post market launch, which can be very disruptive. In addition, to, in addition to merging the supply chains, we also recommend consolidating license types. We propose striking the medical specific license types and instead sub substituting those with a new medical retail endorsement for license holders who choose to offer medical products to patients. This creates the opportunity for more licensees to have medical retail sales. That increases the number of locations which patients can find product while also preserving the existing benefits for cannabis, medical cannabis patients, such as the tax exemption and patient consultation that they rely on. And then finally, uh, our expansion of protections and medical program modifications. You can see the four specific uh, buckets of those protections and modifications. As we develop these re legislative recommendations, one of our guiding lenses has been how do we maintain sustainable access to high quality, affordable products and access to the professionals with expertise in dosage and use of medical can cannabis products to treat or alleviate symptoms. Uh, for patients. That's why our bill also includes these provisions to enhance the program, and each of them, it is really important to note, come directly from feedback and have been informed by the medical and cannabis registry community of patients and caregivers. Uh, that is my attempt to be as succinct as possible about the specific provisions for your consideration this morning, and happy to turn it back to Senator Port or to you, Madam Chair, and uh, available to answer questions. Thank you. I have um, two other testifiers. Um, Maren Schroeder. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Wickland, Senator Port, and members. Uh, my name is Marin Schroeder, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Sensible Change Minnesota, a patient and consumer-led advocacy nonprofit that's been advocating for sensible policies since 2019. Through my work with this organization, I also served last year in the unique role of Coalition Director for Minnesota is Ready, the statewide coalition of stakeholders that worked in support of the full legalization bill. In that role, I spent hundreds of hours meeting with stakeholders and subject matter experts to develop policy recommendations, many of which you will now find in Chapter 342. One of the areas of particular interest to me after all of the work I've done was expanding access to medical cannabis patients through incentivizing small and mid-sized businesses to participate in the market. Unfortunately, 
Um, some of the things in this bill uh, seek to undo that incentive without an answer to how will we grow the medical cannabis market and ensure patients have access throughout the state. There is a huge risk in leaving the medical cannabis market to medical cannabis combination licenses, which is the only license type incentivized to participate in the medical cannabis program under this proposal. It really pits patients against those small and mid-sized businesses we attempted to leverage to improve patient access through the process of de developing Chapter 342, despite other changes proposed like unification of the supply train chain and creating the medical cannabis consultant role that would benefit patients if businesses had incentive to serve the market. With this proposal, there is also no guarantee that the two medical companies currently serving patients today will get a license from a random draw. Minnesota has the smallest medical cannabis program in the country, which hasn't grown or diversified in almost 10 years, and patients continue to have limited access to safe, clean cannabis products until licenses are issued under Chapter 342. Given the proposal and the current timeline for implementation, my concerns that patients will continue to suffer, along with the businesses who have begun preparing for a meritorious application process, continue to grow each time I learn more about how the lottery system is being rolled out. With the removal of the merit system and incentive for the market to serve medical cannabis patients, it is my belief that patients will continue to have extremely limited access despite our best efforts to advocate for the past decade to ensure patients are heard, even if some days it feels like it's for naught. We look forward to continued discussions with policymakers to ensure patient needs aren't lost in this process. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. And now, um, Amber Shimpa. Welcome. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Amber Shimpa, and I'm the CEO of Vireo Health of Minnesota, one of Minnesota's medical cannabis businesses. I was personally present on July 1 of 2015 when Vireo served Minnesota's first medical patients, and for the past nine years, it's been an honor to lead our team while serving more than 50, 55,000 Minnesotans with compassionate care. I am proud of the way we have supported my home state. With our community partners, we have advanced medical research and supported expungement clemency efforts, and we have a nine-year track record of providing jobs for hundreds of Minnesotans and supported labor peace under a CBA with the local 1189 UFCW. We applaud the work that went into last year's, uh, crafting last year's adult use bill and delaying the initial groundwork for the launch of the adult use sales. The bill contained many common sense outcomes streamlining efforts to expunge nonviolent cannabis uh, offenses and charges, generous home grow and possession limits, and the creation of the medical combination license, which allows up to 90,000 square feet of cultivation capacity. Achieving a successful rollout of an adult use program is a challenging undertaking, and we have seen programs fail when the process begins to pit applicants and stakeholders against each other. Our shared responsibility as stewards in cannabis is to become stronger together. This isn't a zero-sum game or winner takes all. A successful industry depends upon folks both competing and working together to have a robust supply chain that supports good business, good product safety, and brings consumers to the regulated and taxed market. The demand for cannabis in Minnesota will be large enough to enable success at every level of the supply chain, but a minimally viable market launch with a slow or tiered issuance of licenses and an insufficient dual supply chain will put a successful program implementation at risk. Establishing licensing timelines for all license types now will provide all applicants the visibility needed to ensure success in the market. Consumers want access to quality products at affordable prices, and making sure supply is adequate to meet this demand is crucial to curbing the illicit market and supporting public safety and generating tax revenue. Unfortunately, last year's bill lacks a clear path to ensuring continuity for access to medical patients. For some patients, medical cannabis is a vital component of managing symptoms and also living a fulfilling life. A responsible rollout in Minnesota must ensure that medical patients can continue accessing the products they rely on. Standalone medical in an emerging adult use market is not a viable business. The continuity of the medical program goes hand in hand with timely licensing of the medical combination license. Existing medical operators like Vireo are already experienced with the unique demands of regulated cannabis markets. 
leaning on our experience in operations while also supporting small businesses and social equity applicants will help ensure adequate supply to meet consumer demand and prevent the illicit market from thriving. This will allow continuity for medical patients, enable success for small businesses and social equity applications, and protect hundreds of existing Minnesota jobs. Minnesotans deserve to have choices in their cannabis industry and a responsible common sense rollout that fully utilizes all available infrastructure can and should be part of this program's implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, that's all the testifiers we have. Members, do you have questions? Um, Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and I'll, I, I don't have any exposure to this bill, but here I think most of my questions are relevant. But um, Senator Port, to the um, medical licenses stuff, um, it seemed like the last testifier seemed like they're not going to be able to get a license except by random, and so I don't know if I ask you or Ms. Briner or somebody, but is is that so? That doesn't make sense to me. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. I will pass it to uh, Director Briner to answer, um, but but say that uh, quickly that the shifting of the medical cannabis program over to OCM will allow for that transition to be smoother. And then as it goes through the licensing process, um, there are various uh, sort of vetting pieces that will be taken into consideration. And I'll pass it to Secretary Briner to go into detail. Ms. Briner. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Port, and Senator Abler. It's nice to see you again. Um, I think that I want to be very clear when uh, the previous testifier was talking about a random selection process that is actually not true. So we are talking about, uh, and it doesn't necessarily fall under the jurisdiction of this committee, but the selection process is uh, predicated on our anticipation that we will have more applications than licenses available. And in Chapter 342, there is already a call for a lottery in a tie-breaking system. So there's sort of a points-based uh, selection system. We propose moving to a vetted selection process in which candidates uh, application candidates for application or a license uh, provide information to us that we can vet, and then uh, assuming that there are more applications than licenses available, we would enter them into a lottery to uh, determine that. As far as the medical program, Minnesota is unique in that other states have allowed the medical program to jumpstart adult use. Uh, that's not a situation that we're in in Minnesota, so we're continuing to evaluate how to maximize our cultivation capacity while also ensuring that we have continuity for medical patients. To the point that I think was made earlier, there are very specific medications uh, that particularly children or patients who are under 21 don't have access to, so we want to ensure continuity of those very specific medical cannabis products, um, and we are working to make sure that in the uh, licensing process that we allow for continuity of those existing registering uh, registered manufacturers. Well, Madam Senator Abler. I have a couple of comments, but that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, they're already vetted. They've actually gone out of their way. They've invested a ton of money. I'm not a fan of this program at all. I, I think that <clears throat> we're going to rue the day we did this, and we'll be back with more treatment programs and 15-year-olds and who are suffering harm. Um, I've already been through that discussion. It didn't work. I thought we should make it 25. It didn't win. Okay, so here's the program. Let's make it work. Uh, but it just seems to me that we write the law, and it's our law, and it's unfair. They haven't even talked to me. It's just from me. So I just my two cents on that. Um, there was talk about um, <clears throat> maybe warning labels, uh, which on the health Im impact I think would be us. I don't have an amendment, but. Have you guys talked about that? We already do it on tobacco. No one seems to have minded that. Big Tobacco fought it. Um, are we going to have warning labels on the little baggies or how are we going to sell it? Ms. Brenner, would you be able to answer that? Thank you, Senator. Thank, thank you, Chair Wickland, and thank you, Senator Abler. Um, Labeling, so package labeling is determined by rule, so that is part of what we are doing right now. We're looking at best practices. Chapter 342 doesn't specifically call for product like warning labels like you have in tobacco, uh, so that is not something contemplated, but we will have consumer information about dosage, uh, all of those things, testing, certificate of analysis on, uh, on the products that are provided for sale. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. I have a restaurant. We're required to put a label on the menus that undercooked meat can make you sick. Um, I just got dinged by our local licensor, so we had to put little stickers on there because we didn't think about that when we made our first menu. Uh, that's as common knowledge as anybody's. So you undercook, you know, chicken, you could get sick. And so I, this is a bigger deal, and I, I just don't understand how... Uh, please, please think about that. Uh, and I don't think the labels work that well, but I think that this is all a lark. Uh, if you're over 25, God bless you. Smoke all you want. It's not going to change your brain very much. But the people that are younger are going to suffer some harm, and we're going to have to deal with them here on future budgets. So I please really wish you would consider one. And, and, and Madam Chair, just off topic, um, if my, uh, my city was talked about doing one of these things, like as a municipality, which you can argue should they even be doing it, um, do they, are they just going to go into the lottery, or is there a municipal consideration if they want to do a municipal one? Um, Madam Brian, Chair, I can take uh, that. Senator, Senator Port. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Abler, that's a great question. Um, I've been in continued conversations uh, with municipalities and uh, various of their uh, leaders. Uh, one of the things that we put in the bill in our last committee in State Gov is to allow for after the social equity applicants uh, get their licenses or get their uh, approval, I guess, from the OCM, we added in an opportunity for municipalities to then be able to access additional licenses before the remaining general lottery. Um, and the only consideration or the only sort of rule that we put in that is that if municipalities choose to get a license, that that license cannot count against the sort of cap that municipalities required us to put in the bill last year about how many so that they do not have the opportunity to sort of um, block everybody else out in their area from having a, a license, but it does give priority to municipalities to be able to enter into the system as well. Thank you. Madam Chair, just one more. I, I know it's short. This is a, no, a really important bill, so I'm, I'm, done. I'm almost done. Um, is, uh, is MDH or someone going to track adverse reactions, consequences, um, kind of by age and demographic? Or who's going to run that? Is that the cannabis uh, team or the MDH or whatever? And that's my last Sen question. Thanks. Senator Port or, or Ms. Brenner? I'm happy to take that. Or Thank you, Chair Wickland. Thank you, Ms. Senator. Uh, yes, we are going to track that. There is a number. There are a number of data collection requirements in House File 100, Chapter 342, including first use psychosis, adverse health effects. Uh, the Department of Health, already with their enforcement of the hemp drive products, are tracking any sort of non-compliant high dosage products and related adverse health impacts, and we would issue consumer warnings in those events and pull those products immediately from shops when we become aware of them. Madam Chair, I just have to say one more thing. I hope Senator that they Abler. track compliant health-related events as well. Because um, <laughs> with all respect to the people that like this, the data doesn't support the idea that this is just harmless, especially in people under 25. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. Thank you, Chair Wickland. Thank you, Senator. And you're right. Um, one of the things that was notable in our demand study that we submitted to the legislature in January is that based on existing consumption patterns, um, one in five people who acknowledge consuming cannabis would qualify for cannabis use disorder. And so we also know that along with this, yes, it is notable. Um, and so along with this, there are also significant health impacts. And so monitoring that, looking at the data, and reporting that on a regular basis will be part of our work at OCM. Senator One in five's a lot, Chair. Thank you. I told you I'd be done. <laughs> like, thank you for your candor. Members, other questions? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Port, and thank you, Director Breiner. Um, there, there, we did provide for some youth use prevention money in, in the, the original bill, right? Ms. Breiner. Thank you, Chair Wickland. Thank you, Senator. That's correct. There is substantial funding for uh, youth prevention and outreach education programs through the Department of Health. There are also um, outreach and education for women who may become pregnant, are pregnant, or are breastfeeding. And all of that work is in progress. The Department of Health is already convening interagency working groups for those grants that will begin in 2025. 
Senator Morrison. Thank you. Um, and then, Madam Chair, one question about the um, the medical cannabis. Is there is there a concern about how um, medical cannabis companies will maintain supply with these changes, or is there a plan to help them do so? Uh, Ms. Briner? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Wicklund. Thank you, Senator. Yes, there is actually um, a requirement in Chapter 342 that the medical cannabis companies maintain a two-to-one ratio of medical products to adult use if they choose to enter the adult use uh, market. Currently, that is monitored at the point of cultivation. We believe that is very difficult to monitor in addition to the expenses that I've noticed uh, noted previously. And so our uh, proposal actually moves that monitoring further downstream in the supply chain at the point of sale and is tracked through the registry. It also makes it easy for patients to actually register a concern or a complaint if they are seeing the unavailability of products and easy for us to enforce as well. Senator Morrison? No. Um, other member questions? Okay, I don't see any more questions or comments. Um, Senator Port, any final um, final thought th thoughts that you'd like to share? Uh, Madam Chair, just thank you for your time. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work with the agency and the legislature to improve Minnesota's cannabis law. Thank you, and thank you for presenting today. Um, I this bill now, as amended, will have will go to the Judiciary Committee. Um, it will go, um, Senator Abler, to the Commerce Committee for more discussion about licensing or the licenses and that process as well. Um, I, I realize you're not on that committee, but just just so you're aware that there will be more discussion about that. Um, and um, I think that it's. Um, thank you for the clear presentation about what we're we're trying to accomplish with this bill. I hope that the, you know, this thought that we need to keep a strong medical cannabis program going and that we're looking ahead to how to best implement it so that we do have um, access for the people who need the medical cannabis program. Um, I appreciate your thoughtfulness in doing that, and um, uh, these changes seem seem like they will um, strengthen that, but I will always be looking out to see if there are other things that I have questions about. Um, at this point, though, we'd like to move the bill forward. Um, I don't see any other questions or concerns. Um, members, the motion, um, Senator Mann moves the that um, Senate File 4782, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. The motion does prevail. Senate file 4782, as amended, is passed and referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. And I will transition to the table for a brief. Um, we will briefly take up um, Senate file 5385. I'm Chair, when you're ready. Thank you. Um, Senate File 5385 is the governor's supplemental budget bill. And in the interest of time, since we are um, running over time and we do have session coming up, um, I, we do have a couple of amendments um, to adopt. Um, but I, I want to bring uh, members' attention to the, the presentations that are the slides and the supplemental budget book and other handouts that we have received. And uh, we do have a testifier who wanted to provide testimony online. So um, I guess if members don't have other particular questions, I will um, just ask that we talk about the, um, the amendment and the other amendment, the two amendments that we have and get that work um, done. And then if members have particular questions that you want to ask a department or an agency. Um, and then I want to make sure we hear from the, the testifier who signed up. 
So um, I guess first I'd, I'd like to um, move the, excuse me, I guess I do, oh no, there are two amendments? Okay. There's two amendments. Uh, first I would like to move the A1 amendment and this A1 amendment is, um, it, there was a repealer included that um, didn't do what the Department of Health in, intended, and so this, this change brings the bill in alignment with their proposal and the way they wanted the language. So that's what the A, A1 amendment does. Members question on the A1? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A1 is adopted to the A24. And the A24 amendment, um, would Senate Council be able to describe that one? I missed looking at that. So if you could describe it, I would appreciate it. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, I believe DHS can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe these appropriations were just forgotten. Um, it appropriates money for the Minnesota Food Shelf Program, for the American Indian Food Sovereignty Funding Program, and the Minnesota Food Bank Funding. These are all included in the change pages, and I believe the intent was to include these appropriations, um, but they were just left out. Thank you, and we're getting thumbs up from the department. Members, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A24 signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The A24 is amended, Madam adopted. Chair. Senator Abler. Oh, thanks. And I, you know, I, I understand, I was in the chair of being a chair trying to fit all this stuff in, but I hope there'll be a time to discuss some of these in more detail than just this whistle stop thing here. Uh, I just want to offer a comment to two parts of the bill, because then I have to go. Uh, we're expanding more state-funded programming in health care um, to more groups here. And to the first bill we had up today, part of why it's not working is we have to pay for what it costs. And as we expand even a greater share into these public programs, it seems humane to the individuals who will get some kind of health care, but it actually just continues the, the, the demise of the ability for these hospitals and clinicians to stay in business. So just wanted to mention that. I, the, and the, and, but I'm, Senator Wickland, I know you know that, but I don't understand why the department who knows that continues to do this in the name of something good while they continue to pay at rates that are below cost. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. We do have a testifier, um, Jove Preby, on Zoom. Hi, uh, yes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for allowing me to testify today. My name is Jill Bates-Reeve, and I work with the Fermented Fermented Mental Health Program as a social work specialist. While I don't work in the care program at the at St. Peter, exposure would impact the work I do at FMHP. Currently, much like other facilities around the state, St. Peter faces a staffing shortage that would be exasperated with the additional 16 beds being added to forensic due to the closure of its care program. We already struggle to fill beds due to our staffing shortage. This would give us beds in a part of a program that are not even necessarily going to help our bed shortage issue. Um, specifically, we need secure beds to properly address the bed shortage issue and to appropriately and safely be able to support clients while also keeping in mind community safety. Opening more beds in a non-secure unit will force us to push forward patients who have not yet had the risk factors appropriately addressed. This ultimately is setting the patient, staff, and community up for possible traumatic events. We have a secure unit that is sitting empty right now because we don't have staffing for it. We need employees to be able to staff that unit before being able to assist with the wait list and the availability, bed availability crisis. While there are similarities in our work, we both both FMHP and CARE provide very distinctly important services. On the forensic side, we, pro we provide evaluations and specialized mental health treatment services to patients statewide who have been civilly committed by the courts as mentally ill and dangerous, with many other of our patients having been charged with serious crimes. The services provided by CARE include inpatient services for the people who are chemically dependent and have co-occurring mental illness, relapse prevention services, and aftercare planning. These services provide Minnesotans who are struggling with addiction the tools to succeed in their journey. Where, where will these patients get services now? 
How will we keep the, these patients and the community safe if we take away from the few events that are already available? Again, thank you, Madam Chair and members for allowing me the opportunity to testify before the committee today. I hope you take the time to carefully consider the choice to close Care Carlson with Care St. Peter as it impacts many Minnesotans, not only those seeking the services care offers and the staff who work to deliver all those important services, but also the community by not having the resources that are needed available and available for questions. Thank you very much. And we did have somewhat of a difficult time hearing you. So if we could get your testimony also written, that would be very, very helpful. Oh, absolutely. I apologize for that. Thank you. Uh, members, questions? Seeing none, Senator Wickman. Yeah, I'll just um, comment. I, uh, it would be nice to have time to go through you know, carefully this this budget proposal and the slides. Um, I hope that members will review the the information that we've been provided. Um, I think there will be opportunity um, to talk about specific proposals as we move forward with our omnibus bill. Um, you will have the opportunity to to get into more depth in um, proposals that are moved forward. We mainly wanted to get the bill um, heard today so that it is available for us as we put together the omnibus. Thank you. So uh, Senate file 5385 will be laid over. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, Madam Chair.